The song is an insufficient explainer, but it is helpful. If you've ever seen Hamilton, you know the song, The Room Where It Happens. This song portrays the dinner table bargain between Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison. They agreed to a deal, the passage of Hamilton's debt plan through Congress in exchange for the placement of the new American capital city in the South. President Washington would later personally select the spot along the Potomac, which would become Washington, District of Columbia. That description leaves out the issue of slavery, and that's one place I'm headed. Before Washington, D.C. was the capital of the United States, it was largely farmland. Had New York or Philadelphia been selected as the permanent seat of the federal government, there would have been pre-existing places, people, population, but it's partly because of the difficulty of integrating into a pre-existing space and the crisscross authority of federal, city, and state that a separate space was chosen. And thus, farmland tended by enslaved people was chosen as the place where the federal city, a new capital, would be built, Washington, D.C. But what would serve as a model for this new American capital? One of the most powerful monarchs in Europe in the previous century had been Louis XIV, who had reigned in France until 1715. The luxury of the Sun King's lifestyle and the absolutism of his power were reflected in the architecture and design which surrounded him, most notably in Versailles. Louis' Versailles palace and its surroundings came to symbolize his power. In St. Petersburg and Potsdam and Vienna, architects looked to Versailles when designing new palaces. But only one man would use Versailles to design an entire city. In 1776, Frenchman Pierre Charles L'Enfant joined the American Continental Army and served during the Revolutionary War. After the United States won that war and achieved independence, L'Enfant decided he wished to design the new capital city for the United States. What some loftier types called a New Jerusalem. It was, in fact, at this time, farmland, and in popular memory, a swampy mess along the Potomac. The Enfant would transform this farmland from scratch, and he would design an American Versailles. L'Enfant wrote to Washington in September of 1789, offering his services to design what he described as, quote, the capital of this vast empire. The design would incorporate the beauty of Athens and the architecture of the finest cities in Europe. In particular, L'Enfant's Washington city had roads and walkways that would mimic the geometry of Louis XIV's Versailles. Talk of a vast empire aside, President Washington believed L'Enfant could help design the District of Columbia to fit the vision of a grand New World Republic, a vision in comportment with the potential of the United States. Washington had come to know L'Enfant during the Revolutionary War, and L'Enfant helped renovate New York City Hall for use as the first federal hall. The lobbying letter worked. George Washington appointed L'Enfant to design the federal district in 1791. So as you can now see, the federal district, Washington DC as it is known today, was designed from literally the ground up. An account of the early days of Washington's development can be found in J.D. Dickey's Empire of Mud. But DC DC wasn't only artistically, architecturally designed from the ground up, the values of the new United States were infused into the federal district as well. Now stop right there. I, I'm not spinning a lofty narrative about liberty. America was about freedom. Washington DC was about freedom. No, no, no. What I'm suggesting is that the debates about how the United States should be and a couple of its historical demons are entwined in the story of the District of Columbia. For example, would the United States be a decentralized republic with a weak federal government? If so, then the federal district should comprise a small acreage and modest buildings. That's what Thomas Jefferson wanted. Or should the United States have at its core an expansive federal government, a large federal district with extravagant buildings matched only by the power wielded by those inside. That's what Alexander Hamilton wanted. Well, we already know by selecting Law Enfant to design the federal city, President Washington was casting his vote for something exuding expansive power. A related question, should that power be placed in the northern part of the former 13 colonies, near a metropolitan economic center like New York? Or perhaps that new power center should go to the agrarian south? Embodied in this question is the issue that follows throughout America's pre-Civil War history. Should the United States capital city 
physically be near or far from the core of the institution of slavery? Should the capital have slavery within it? And might the answer to those two questions affect the policies created there? Spoiler, Washington DC is in the South. Let's find out the reasons why. Rewind to 1783, Congressman Alexander Hamilton was 29 years old. In spring 1783, a peace treaty was in the works with Britain, and the end of the Revolutionary War, so demobilization of armed forces, lingered in the minds of soldiers. Would they be paid properly for their service in creating an independent United States? The problem was that the government was broke, and pleas to individual states to send money to pay continental soldiers were met without much help. A large number of those unpaid soldiers were in the state of Pennsylvania. At the time, the United States Continental Congress was meeting in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And so when news arrived that a small group of furloughed soldiers were marching to Philadelphia to demand the payment owed for services in the Continental Army, there was concern. The soldiers increased their numbers as they approached, joined other soldiers in local barracks, gained access to ammunition and cannon, and soon counted near 500 men. Representatives of the federal government, Alexander Hamilton included, implored Pennsylvania state officials to intervene with the state militia. Hamilton and others did this because the federal government had no peacekeeping slash law enforcement force of its own. In fact, the only force it controlled was the Continental Army, a fraction of which was the very group of soldiers marching on Philadelphia. Congress's only course of action was asking for help, which was denied. Until these approaching soldiers actually did something, aka perpetrated some violence, the state of Pennsylvania said, we won't take action. This disrespect from Pennsylvania to intervene on the higher authority of Congress left Hamilton aggrieved. And the result of inaction was that the soldiers began threatening the Pennsylvania State House with muskets. Inside were federal officials meeting to discuss the crisis. Encircled, the congressional delegates tried and succeeded in leaving the State House with surprisingly few jeers or threats. A bit undignified, the whole thing. It's almost like Hamilton and the other representatives of Congress weren't even considered that important by the mutineers. Threatening them or attacking them wasn't even worth the insurrectionists time. The affair was resolved when a rumor spread that General Washington had dispatched other troops to put down the insurrection. The crisis resolved quietly. Hamilton and Pennsylvania authorities were left to squabble over their differences in reports and passive aggressive letters like this lengthy tweet thread like letter Hamilton sent to John Dickinson. But here's the point. Alexander Hamilton was determined to make the affair into something larger, something that would demand real reform, a new, more centralized government. Did it matter that the affair died down without much trouble? No, it was to be a prop, a prop deployed to convince others that a strong American federal government would be required, one with its own forces to defend Congress and thereby its authority. Hamilton wrote that the quote, authority of the United States has this day been grossly insulted and suggested that members of Congress had been a form of prisoner during the encirclement of the state house. And of course, this leads us back to Washington DC. The mutiny of 1783 was one reason early lawmakers creating a new constitution in 1787 decided for a standalone federal district under federal forces. James Madison defended the decision to include a separate federal district with autonomy in Federalist number 43. Quote, the indispensable necessity of complete authority at the seat of government carries its own evidence with it. It is a power exercised by every legislature of the union. I might say of the world, by virtue of its general supremacy. Madison goes on to argue that without such a place and without such authority, bad actors might humiliate Congress's power again, or Congress might be dependent on state help again. Unacceptable. The actual provision in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, gave Congress power to create the federal district and the power to, quote, exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square, as may, by session of particular states and the acceptance of Congress, become the seat of government 
of the United States. The existence of a federal district already tells us something about the character of the new American government. It wasn't gonna be a functionary council like the Continental Congress or the Articles of Confederation Congress. It was gonna grow up and be a real central authority. But the expression of that character was yet to be defined. And of course, they hadn't picked an actual location yet. To understand how the federal government finally ended up in DC, in the South, we have to revisit Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton believed in a strong federal government led by a strong executive with limited state sovereignty. As such, he also believed in centralized and ambitious federal finance, seeing the managing of credit as a blessing for powerful countries with powerful economies. So as President Washington's Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton provided a fundamental belief in the power of leveraging debt. And so when tasked by President Washington with dealing with the country's debt, which totaled around $80 million, Hamilton jumped to handle it in a way that fit his long-term vision for federal finances. First, around 25 million of the 80 million was held by individual states. Hamilton's plan would combine all that and handle it at the federal level. Second, he would fiddle with bond interest rates. And third, he would raise taxes on alcohol. The most controversial portion of the plan was the assumption of state debt by the federal government. Some states had no debt, so objected to paying for the debt of other states. Further, it was clear that the plan was a means to centralize the financial power of the federal government and was opposed for its long-term implications. So what does this have to do with Washington, D.C.? Well, this debate became intertwined with the topic of the new capital because Hamilton approached Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson for help. Jefferson stood opposite Hamilton politically, opposing a large federal government and finding virtue in the power of the individual states. But exactly because Jefferson had sway with the political opposition, Hamilton approached him and James Madison for help. Could they cut some sort of a deal to pass Hamilton's debt plan? They could. Though Madison had been vocal in opposition to Hamilton's debt plan, he agreed to no longer voice that opposition were the capital of the United States moved to a spot along the Potomac in the South and not to a Northern city like New York. Jefferson's is the only direct account we have of the so-called dinner table bargain. The debt plan would be a bitter pill, he wrote, quote, as the pill would be a bitter one to the Southern states, something should be done to soothe them. That the removal of the seat of government to the Potomac was a just measure. And so the debt plan passed. In addition, the Residence Act of 1790 was ironed out, which established the procedure for placing the new federal city. As per the Constitution, an area not to exceed 10 square miles would be selected. And per the law, President Washington would personally make the selection along the Potomac. Both Maryland and Virginia offered land for the district, and both offers were accepted. The District of Columbia was on the way. In a twist of fate, Thomas Jefferson, who opposed a grandiose federal city, was ultimately assigned by Washington to oversee Law Enfant's work in designing and executing the plan for a federal city. Jefferson, while supporting a space for the federal government generally, envisioned something far smaller, a fraction of what the federal area of the District of Columbia came to be. There would be enough space for the government buildings and nothing more and certainly nothing grand. Jefferson's vision of a farmer's republic certainly fit this aesthetic. The federal government should be small compared to the state governments like his native Virginia, and therefore the federal district was to be small too. Of course, as we know today, that vision of a tiny federal city with modest buildings did not come to pass. And so we now see roughly how DC was selected and what that implied for the nature of the federal government and the balance of geographic power between North and South. In exchange for power placed in the South, that power would have financial abilities many of the Southerners opposed. Compromise. I do think that's an okay explanation. And a shortened version of this is what we get in school and in hit musicals. But there's one dimension that only gets indirect treatment in these accounts. Slavery. It is simply not sufficient to leave the compromise description as financial plan in exchange for capital in the South. It doesn't do either half justice. It wasn't a mere debt plan. It was a bid to create a fundamental financial sea change with a federal government at its core. It was a seed. The 
capital in the South bit is also grossly underexplained. It wasn't merely out of geographic affinity, closeness to home as the Jefferson character sang in Hamilton. The land that became the District of Columbia was not an abandoned swamp as popular culture imagines. It was full of farmland with enslaved people. Ash and Musgrove wrote it best in Chocolate City, A History of Race and Democracy, in the nation's capital. Quote, the area that became Washington was not a tabula rasa, not an uninhabited swampy wilderness. It was a fully functioning slave society, a land dotted with tobacco plantations owned by powerful slaveholding families. Slavery and the aristocratic political lifestyle that accompanied it defined life in the fields of Southern Maryland and Northern Virginia that became the national seat of government. It's fair, and necessary that we consider the tension surrounding slavery as a factor in the selection of Washington, D.C. Both Virginia and Maryland, the states that border D.C., were slave states. And so slavery would be a legal and integral part of DC. And this integration of slavery into the US capital city meant that in a modern phrase, the institution would be normalized. Many Southerners believe that having the capital in the South would help fight the tide of abolitionism gaining ground in the North and internationally. Jefferson believed this too. Southerners originally feared that Hamilton's debt plan would strengthen the federal government and thus indirectly strengthen federal meddling in the institution institution of slavery, thus contributing to that bitter pill we heard about earlier. Some of DC's most iconic buildings were built with slave labor. It was budgeted for, and enslaved people would be bought and sold within the district, within a stone's throw of Congress and the White House. Slavery mattered. Skeptics will ask for the receipts. Where is the document? A letter from politician one to politician two justifying the selection of DC with the preservation of slavery. Where is the section of Jefferson's account of the dinner table bargain that references slavery? In creating this video, I followed the paper trails of several historians and read lots of primary sources. I didn't find that written down smoking gun. To be blunt, to see reality, one has to look up from the papers, look at people and power. People. When the dinner table bargain was made, Jefferson, Hamilton, and Madison, all of them slaveholders, were served the dinner half of the dinner table bargain by Jefferson's enslaved workers. Once built, Washington DC was a slave city. Slaves were kept in pens until they were sent elsewhere. A famous slave jail, the so-called Yellow House, was half a mile west of Capitol Hill. Slaves participated in building the White House. The labor was budgeted for and paid for through masters. Power. Slavery surrounded lawmakers like water surrounds fish. When legislating on the growth of slavery in new states through the Missouri Compromise, the Compromise of 1850, 50, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, lawmakers soaked in a bath of bodies and buildings. The vicinity of the status quo must have tempted them to cut a deal. Look at it this way. In 1703, when Peter the Great, Tsar of Russia, instructed that a new Russian city, St. Petersburg, be constructed from the ground up, he selected the spot for seafaring reasons, European access, trade. His intent for Russia was baked in his selection. How could Russia be a modern European state and not a backwater? At the start of his reign, Peter the Great didn't know quite what it was that made Western Europe Western Europe, and so he planned something called the Grand Embassy. Peter commissioned this Grand Embassy to tour European states to find out the keys to their navies, their architecture, their old monarchies, their power. This Europhile's curiosity literally drew him towards Europe. He accompanied the Grand Embassy himself to Vienna, Amsterdam, and London. And when he returned and used his absolute power as the Russian Tsar to build St. Petersburg from scratch, he did it with clear intention. A place for ships like the Europeans had, buildings like the Europeans had, prosperity like the Europeans had, shortened beards and clothing styles like the Europeans had. Peter's intent is clear from just looking at the city he built. Washington DC, like St. Petersburg, was built. And we can learn about the intentions of those who made it by just 
looking at it. If the rough location of a new capital is decided by three slaveholders, Jefferson, Madison, and yes, Hamilton, and if the specific location is selected by another slaveholder, Washington, and that capital of the new country is placed in between two slave states and is built with slave labor and legislates compromise to protect the institution of slavery, then that economic model, that state of injustice, is intentionally integrated into that capital. Might our common shorthand financial plan for capital location be in need of amending? I think so. What about you? Let me know in the comments. Later, y'all.